Good morning. Uh, here we are again <clears throat> in, uh, in this new uh, situation that we find ourselves in. And uh, very oddly sometimes to be in the situation, but even more so uh, today as we, uh, as we celebrate Palm Sunday. <clears throat> a time of certainly celebration uh, for the Jewish people. And certainly it was time of preparation for our Lord as he was entering Jerusalem and preparing himself for, uh, for what the Lord, uh, for what the Father had called him to do. <clears throat> so I want to read a passage from Scripture, Matthew chapter 21, I'll be reading verses 1 through 17. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to, came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her called by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to, to daughter Sion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them and, and for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called the house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, he replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Uh, as we come to Matthew chapter 11, uh, we see that this is really the, the final chapter uh, in the life of Christ, the earthly life of Christ, um, that all that he's been preparing for has come to this moment. Um, he's, been, he's been working so hard to do uh, the Father's work, to accomplish the mission that he was sent to do. And here he is uh, at the climax of that very mission. Of course, it's also a time when the Jews are celebrating the Passover. They're just entering Jerusalem, and there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people um, coming from all over uh, to celebrate the Passover, uh, to celebrate that time, that remembrance, when they were in bondage in Egypt, when they had experienced such hardships under Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and God had delivered them. God had taken them out, and uh, the Passover is that, that of course, that, that evening when um, the angel of death, was to pass over uh, the land, and those who did not have their doorposts covered with blood uh, would be victims of the very uh, this very plague that was coming upon them. And so this is the covering of the lamb, the, the blood of the lamb, and of course, symbolic of the blood of Christ, it cover, covering our sins. So it's a very powerful time, an incredible time, when again, Jesus is coming, and he's going to come die at that time. He's not coming to die during Yom Kippur. He's coming during Passover. He's coming to deliver his people. But of course, uh, people are excited about that. Jesus has been doing ministry for three years now, and he's been going everywhere, preaching and teaching, of course, healing so many people. And the people are excited about this. Uh, they're so excited about this, this great man because they think maybe he's more than just a prophet. Maybe he's more than just a healer. Maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the one who's coming to deliver us from the oppression of the Roman Empire and to finally release us that we can be liberated Again, a people that still lives with a mindset of being exiled, even though they're back in the land, they still see themselves as exiled because God is not in control. God is not ruling. There's, there's a foreign power over them. And so they, they want to be released from this. And Jesus, of course, does not disappoint them. He comes in and he comes in a way that 
Uh, it's very majestic, very prophetic. Uh, again, to fulfill prophecy, the prophecy of Zechariah about uh, the king coming in in a very lowly fashion, very gentle, uh, but yet he's still coming in, and he's still coming in as king. So a very powerful thing to see. Of course, the powers of darkness are also preparing themselves. They have been ready for this time, of course. They've been trying to hamper and destroy the ministry of Jesus right from the beginning. Uh, right, right from the moment he's going to be born, we have the children in Bethlehem being slaughtered. The enemy has never stopped. The powers of darkness have never stopped trying to come after Jesus, whether it's trying to destroy him, trying to tempt him and, and derail him from the ministry that he has. You know, trying to make sure that he takes another course other than the course that God that God has for him, and um, and so they're they're prepared, and of course they're working through the religious leaders and through the powerful leaders of that time to move them towards uh, destroying Christ, uh, towards uh, killing him, and of course they're working most powerfully in the heart of Judas to betray his master. So here is Judas, who again has been with Jesus three years. Uh, but has become disheartened by what he has seen. Uh, he, like many others, probably was looking for that revolutionary who would come and just uh, release people from their bondage. Instead, what he's really getting is a meek and mild uh, reformer who's not really looks like he's going to do anything drastic. He's not going to pick up a sword. On the contrary, he's against picking up the sword. Um, this is this is who Judas is. You know, uh, I remember when that Gospel of Judas came out. And of course, I knew about it from from the ancient writings like Arrhenius who, who had mentioned it. But the Gospel of Judas try to, tries to portray Judas as, uh, as the hero. That Jesus realizes he has to go through this and he needs someone to ignite it and push it forward and do this so that he can be released from the body and be back to the Father. And he tells Judas, you know, you're going to be hated, you're going to be scorned, whatever, but, you know, you'll be the hero. We know that you're the one. And, of course, that's not true at all. He is the villain and the greatest of villains because it's one thing for a stranger to to betray you, it's just, it's it's different when a stranger uh, does something harmful to you. But when your best friend, when one of your best friends who sits with you and has seen you for three years, and you've ministered to this person, you've shown you've shown him the love of God to him, and yet he's the one who's plotting against you. That's that's very heartbreaking. That's very uh, uh, harsh indeed. And so uh, this is this is what it's come to. But of course, that's going to happen later on in the week. Right now, there's excitement. There's excitement of Jesus coming in, and people are so happy because they know this is the prophet. This is the prophet from Nazareth. He's here. He is, and he's done all these wondrous things. And now he's coming to Jerusalem today, you know, during this time of celebration. So they're very happy to bring him in. And of course, they're shouting Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the Lord. Uh, this is a great time and a great excitement for them. Of course, it's quickly uh, brought down, you know, like from from a major key to a minor key when Jesus goes into the temple and then causes havoc. By overturning the tables and uh, just giving in the kind of messages maybe they weren't expecting. Uh, oh yeah, overturn the tables. Yeah, oh, you know, be brutal, be harsh, but not to us, not to not to the, to us as the people of God. Be, do, do it to the Gentiles. Do it to the to the Romans, not to us. And so, of course, um, very uh, a very mixed message for them. But today, as we look at this passage, I want us to focus on three things, and those three things are are important. When it comes to the Christian life, how we come to know God, how we come to realize who we are, how desperately we need God, and to turn away from our sins and to accept Him. And there's no better time to think about that than, of course, uh, this week as we're remembering the death and the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, the first thing I want us to do is, is, is focus on that word Hosanna. Hosanna means save us. Uh, God save us. That's literally what it means. And so, of course, this is what people are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us from the Roman oppressors, save us from all these horrible things. Uh, they see Jesus as a Savior, but not a Savior from their sins, not from their own rebellion. I mean, they, they are going to so turn on him because they realize you're not calling the Gentiles to repentance. You're not going to bring judgment on them. You're calling us to repentance. But that's what he's been telling them for three years. To repent, that's what John the Baptist was telling them to, to do. John the Baptist was telling him, look, uh, God can take one of these stones and make a son of Abraham. Unless you repent, you too will, will perish. Uh, and yet they weren't listening. They're not listening because they, they're hearing what they want to hear. And what they want to hear is uh, a deliverance from the Roman Empire, from the oppression, the physical oppression that they're going through. And that, of course, makes a great deal of sense. Today, many people are crying out to Jesus too. 
uh, God save us, Hosanna, God save us, God save us. But they mean save us from the coronavirus, save us from this predicament, save us from the fact that we're losing our jobs or, or, or this is happening or that's happening. Um, this deadly virus is, is, uh, is devastating us. Deliver us. But that's, that's the deliverance they want. They don't want a deliverance from their sins. They're not turning to God and saying, God, you know what? In light of what's going on, I realize, yes, I'm a sinner and I need to repent of my sins. And I entrust myself to you that whatever occurs, whether this virus takes me or doesn't take me, I entrust my life and my all to you. Uh, and that's what we would hope that people would do. Uh, Grant Osborne uh, states things very well in his uh, commenter on Matthew. He says, they're thinking of the conquering victor, while Jesus intends it of the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, by riding a donkey rather than a war horse. Jesus will become the Davidic Messiah on the cross, not on the battlefield. And that's, that's exactly what the Lord is doing. Uh, he's not coming to be victorious on the battlefield. He's not going to take a, a, a white stallion and, and ride into Jerusalem like Judas Maccabees did many years ago. And um, uh, around 168 uh, BC, Judas Maccabees had done just that. And when he came into the city, what did he do? They put palm branches. They said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were shouting the same things they're saying to Jesus. Um, they want Jesus to be that second Judas Maccabees to deliver them. But he's not coming to deliver them from their physical oppressors. He's coming to deliver them from their sins. In a few days, he will be crucified for the sins of the world. He's come to give us forgiveness and eternal life, to share in the life of God in that in that. Uh, that life of the new age that he is bringing in. Uh, but again, they have no clue of that at this point. Where they're, what they're wanting is that God would deliver them physically uh, from their oppressors, not that, that God would deliver them from sins. But this is the first prayer that we need to pray uh, if we want God in our lives. We need to tell God, God, save us. Deliver us from our sins. Um, not from this virus not from financial circumstances, not from all these things that may or may not occur. God deliver us from our sins. The great virus, the great deadly disease within us is sin. It's the deadness that we're carrying because we're in rebellion to God. And the only way we can remedy that is by acknowledging, uh, as the Holy Spirit is moving us, as the Holy Spirit is convicting us, to acknowledge that we're sinners, that we need to repent of our sins, that we need to accept God as our Savior. This is the first thing we need to do. Um, we cannot fix our own situation. We cannot uh, remedy this thing. We have to cry out to God. Uh, and when we cry out to God for deliverance, He will deliver us. But it's ironic that people don't want to cry out to God for this. They want to cry out to God for other things. Uh, when it comes to, to God, they, they want to somehow bargain with God. They somehow want to do some sort of deal with God. They want to somehow maybe pay if they had to. I think people would rather pay, you know. What can I give God? You know, how much money do I have to give him for him to deliver me from the coronavirus? How much money do I have to give him for him to take me out of the financial crisis I'm in? How much money do I have to give him for him to uh, heal my family? Uh, or help me get that new job? Or help me to find that perfect mate? How much do I have to give him? And they're, they're willing to do that. It's amazing how people would rather pay God than to surrender to God and to the will of God and to what God has for them. Uh, the unfortunate truth is that people are looking for Jesus to save them out of their situations. And when you hear uh, a number of preachers today, that's exactly what they're preaching. They're saying God is going to deliver you and God is going to help you financially. God is going to give you that house. God is going to give you that mate. God is going to do all these things. And this becomes their focus in preaching. Of course, people are going to gravitate to that. They're going to gravitate to someone who's going to say to them, God wants you to be happy in this life, period. And he wants you to have all these things in this life, period. And certainly nothing about forgiveness, about uh, dying with Christ, about sharing in the resurrection of Christ. That way, no, they want it now. They want Jesus to be their accountant and their healer and their everything here and now. Uh, they don't want, they're not looking for the future. Uh, others are just looking because they want Jesus, of course, to, to bring that, to, to deliver them from that heal, uh, illness, to bring healing. If Jesus won't bring what they want, then, then they don't want any other Jesus. They want someone to completely remove uh, whatever it is that they're going through. Uh, you know, when we read about, about, about Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 
he talks about the thorn in the flesh, and he says, Therefore, in order to keep me from being coming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. You're not going to hear that kind of sermon being preached from these prosperity preachers. They're not going to come to a passage like this where it shows Paul admitting that he submitted to the will of God and that he God showed him that this thorn served a purpose and that it was a good thing and that more important this thorn was God's grace suppl being supplied to him. So that it wasn't that God took him out of the circumstances. God didn't heal him. God supplied the grace for him to be able to sustain and endure and move forward. And that's exactly what the Word of God tells us, but that's not what you're going to hear. And that's not what people wanted back in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and that's not what they want now. People want this God to deliver them here and now. They want God to uh, heal them, uh, take care of their financial problem, take care of the situation, and then they can go on their merry way to live their lives. They don't want an intrusive God who says, I'm here to move in. I'm here to move into your house and to become Lord of your house. And you just listen to me and follow my instructions and everything will be fine. That's not what they want to hear. They want a God who says, okay, here, I came in. I took care of what you wanted. I'm out of here, okay? And they would love that. They, they, that's a perfect God for them. A God who just comes in, you know, uh, comes in and rescues them and, and delivers them. And that's it. And they're out. Uh, but that's not the God that exists in the Bible. That's not what God offers us. Uh, God offers us to come into our lives and to save us, to redeem us. And then to go even further, to cleanse us. And we see the, the very that very thing when we see Jesus going to a temple. Of course, when he comes to a temple, it's, a, it's also a form of judgment. I'm going to get to that as well. But it is a cleansing. You know, uh, They want Jesus to, to be the Messiah, to be prophetic, to be powerful. And yet when he is, they don't like what they see. Uh, Jesus comes in, Jesus entered the temple area, drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the, and the benches of those selling doves. This had become a racket. The place where God is supposed to be worshipped, the place where God is supposed to be served, has become a racket. Uh, first of all, uh, you had to have the right amount of money to pay the temple tax. It was half a shekel. And in order to get the half a shekel, you had to get it from the temple area. So you had to go there with your own money, and then have a coin uh, changed so that you will get this coin. Of course, the Pharisees are in on this. The religious leaders are, are making a good buck on this. So you have to change your coin. And then even the animal you bring, well, you don't know if the animal's unclean, clean, uh, questionable. It may not be acceptable. So you have to buy one there. So again, a racket. You know, everything to make sure that they're, uh, they're taking from you as much as possible. And this is what they've made the temple. This is what they made the offering of forgiveness to the people of God. Something that they can purchase. And people are doing it. They're purchasing forgiveness. They're purchasing being right with God. And Jesus comes in and he wracks havoc, havoc on this and says, No, 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 no. This is not what it's supposed to be. My house is supposed to be a house of prayer. He says, It is written, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Um... Jesus will not turn a blind eye to corruption. When he comes into our lives, when we ask him to come in and to cleanse us, uh, to save us, we better be ready that he's going to cleanse us. It's not like that he's going to be save us, well, he's going to take us out of our situation, whatever, but inside we're going to remain dirty, we're going to remain unclean. No, 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 he, he's coming to clean. He's coming to create a place where he is going to live, where the Spirit of God is going to dwell. And the Spirit of God is holy. And the Spirit of God that is holy cannot abide in unholy places. And so God is going to clean us, but that's not what we want. And how many times I've heard people uh, preach this passage, of course, to kind of uh, promote what Jesus did. That we should go into places that pretend to be Christian or religious and overturn the tables. Luckily, no one's ever done that and ever come to our church and try to do that. That would be, I don't know, maybe my reaction would be more laughter than anything else, but because I come from a... Uh, a group of young men and women that when we were young Christians, we were fanatical. We were uh, we were the kind of people that would do stuff like that. And I remember one of us, 
Now, I did actually some, do some light. He went to, into uh, Christian publications in New York when, they, when it was there on uh, 43rd. And he went in and he just overturned everything. He was arrested. You know, that was like, that became like apocryphal uh, lesson for us. We would, we would tell, retell, tell and retell the story over and over again and, um, and just admire this whole thing. But ironically, uh, now I tell that story to bring out just the very opposite because he, here's a young man who went in, overturned the tables, uh, trying to be zealous for the Lord, got arrested, and yet today he's in Zen Buddhism. He abandoned Christ. He abandoned the very things that he was so passionate about. And he went and became, uh, has, become into, has gone to Zen Buddhism. So again, what does that say, what does that say to us? You know, what does it say uh, about him? Uh, that that's not that's not what this passage is calling for. It's calling us to be saved, and to and then to have the the Lord cleanse our lives, transform us. This is the important thing. This is what we have to seek, and this is exactly what the Lord wants to do. He wants to change us. He wants to transform us. Um, now, certainly, we do need to stand up for those things that are wrong. I'm not saying the opposite either. I'm not saying don't stand up for things that are wrong. We do. Um, we need to uh, make sure that we are doing things with the right with the Lord, and that. When we see evil and we see things that are bad, that we do speak up, uh, whether it's uh, in the world, but certainly when it's in the house of God, most definitely, because that is our major concern, what's going on here. Um, how, but how, now we come to the place, of course, uh, where people are, are, you know, are doing this, but this is not what the primary point of this is, is that Christ has come to cleanse, Christ comes in, and he wants to come into the temple of our, our existence, our place, and to cleanse us out. And when he does come in, what does he have to clean out? When when he does come in, what would he have to remove? What is there in your life that needs to be cleansed, that needs to be taken out? Because the fact is, you cannot serve God, you cannot worship God with this kind of filth in your life, with these kind of things in your life. You need to get rid of these things from your life. There's a wonderful passage right in the beginning of Isaiah where it shows the importance of, of being clean before God. You know, today we're so much into clean hands. But it's talking about spiritual cleansing, to, to be completely clean uh, as we come before the Lord. It says in chapter 1 of Isaiah, When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my hands, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the cause of the widow. Again, here, here's the Lord saying, you're, you're playing religion. You're playing religion. You're going through all the emotions. You're making it look very good, but your heart is far away from you. Your heart is filthy. Your heart is sinful. And your actions prove it. You are out there oppressing people and doing harmful things rather than, rather than helping them. Uh, if you were helping them, you would be demonstrating that you are children of the light. So again, there, there's the importance of being cleansed, of being, uh, 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 of being renewed. Our mindset has to be the mindset of, of the tax collector in the parable that Jesus tells. When here's the Pharisee being very proud, I've done this, I've done this, I've done that. And the tax collector is far away, doesn't even dare look up. And he says, you know, God be merciful to me, a sinner. That is our prayer. Our prayer is that God will come and be merciful to us and cleanse us of our sins, remove all these things um, so that we can worship him correctly. And not only as individuals. As individuals, yes, we need to pray for forgiveness, that God will forgive us and cleanse us. And we should be doing that our, our, on a solitary basis when we're alone. But when we come together as a church, we need to pray the same prayer that God will cleanse us as a church, as the body of Christ, that if there's any sin that will be removed so that we can worship Him correctly. And that's what the important thing. Now, of course, if there is no cleansing, then there is judgment. And judgment is all that remains. If God is going to come into the temple of your place and you're going to be buying and selling and doing all kinds of corrupt things and you're not willing to change, then, of course, the only thing that remains is judgment. And that's actually what Jesus is doing in this passage. He is actually judging the temple and the people who who are doing work in the temple because of what they've done to it, and of course we know that um, soon thereafter, you know, some twenty, thirty years after Jesus, the temple will be destroyed completely, and uh, they won't be able to make a mockery 
of sacrifice anymore. So, of course, uh, we, need, we need to call out God save us. We need to be cleansed by God. And then we know that God would hear us. You know, look at verses 15 and 16. But when the chief priests and teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, Jesus replied. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? Um, this passage, of course, seems so simple, so nonchalant, so easy to pass over, but it's a very pow powerful passage because uh, what Jesus is saying is a very radical thing. Uh, Jesus is redefining the people of God. Now, you may not get that from this passage. He is redefining the people of God. Grant Osborne, again, his commentary says, In the present story, two things have occurred. Jesus has symbolically proclaimed divine judgment on the nation for desecration of the temple, and he has raised up a new Israel from their midst, symbolized in the blind and lame he heals and the children whose cry he accepts. These people are considered nothing. The lame, the blind, children, meaningless, useless. Push them aside. And yet, these are the ones that God is saying, these are my people. This is how the people of God are to be. This is the new Israel. This is the true Israel. And of course, again, I mean, the Pharisees hear, and they do hear very well exactly what he is, what he is saying, and, and the judgment that is coming down upon them. As John writes in his gospel, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. He was in the world, and, through, and, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, the Jewish people, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a father's will, but born of God. This is the people of God. This is what God has done right from the beginning with Abraham. Abraham was not a Jew. Abraham was a Babylonian. God created the Jewish people. He created the new Jewish nation. He's still creating the Jew. The true Jew is the one who is one inwardly, not outwardly. Abraham is a, a prototype of that. Abraham was a Gentile. Abraham was Babylonian. And yet here's the one that God calls out, and he in faith and obedience listens, and God creates a people out of him. And what God has done with Abraham is still what he's doing today. That God is going, and he's gone to Israel, and he's called them to repent, and he's called them to do what is right, but they choose not to. So God then goes to the outcast. He goes to the one who's rejected, the ones that they have nothing to do with, the people that you look at and say, no, you know, they're, they're worthless, they're meaningless, I don't care about them. Like, let, them. let them go their own way. And God says, well, then those will be mine. Those will be mine because those are the ones who are listening to the voice of God. Those are the ones who are obeying. You know, what, what God has done within our lives and what he desires to do is to prepare people for himself, to make of us a temple. Think about it. This is what occurs in the New Testament. The temple is destroyed, and yet Paul says, we are the temple of the living God. Not only, not only collectively, not only when we get together as the body of Christ, but individually, we are the temple of God. And, and what is to be the response of those who are redeemed, who are washed, who are welcomed at the table of the Messiah? Praise praise and worship you know before they even bring him into jerusalem and do you know hosanna they should have said save us cleanse us and now we can praise him praise is the outcome of being delivered from our sins praise is the outcome of being cleansed from our sins deuteronomy 32 3 says i will proclaim the name of the lord oh praise the greatness of our god first chronicle 16 25 Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Praise is the natural response of the people of God. Because our God has saved us, our God has delivered us. The, the way that we can welcome Jesus, welcome Jesus into our lives and the church is through praise and worship. Um, God dwells in the midst of the people who are praising him. And so we should praise him, glorify him in all that we do. And of course, you know, the first thing that happens to us, of course, because we know that we are sinners. We know that there is, there is dirt and still dirt within us. Even after Christ cleanses us, we know that we still sin. And one of my feel is that we are, we are unworthy uh, to praise God, that we are unworthy to be the one. You know, it, it should be the Pharisees. It should be 
those religious people. It should be uh, those people who, who are clean cut and do this and do that. Those are the people who should be praising God, not me, not me. If you only knew me, if you only knew where I came from, if you only knew the circumstances that I was born in, how I was raised, the filth that I was around with in, in my youth, you would say, ah, not him, not him. Uh, and so, yes, there is a sense that we're, because we do realize that we're sinners, we still feel unworthy. Uh, the thing is that even if you feel unworthy, you know, I don't want to say it so simply, but get over it. We are unworthy. Of course we're unworthy. But God is worthy. Of course. Uh, who are we? We're nothing. But He is everything. And He's the one who's called us to praise Him. And He accepts and welcomes our praise. So that's the good thing. You know, all of us have sinned. All of us lack the glory of God. But God is the one who is worthy. God is the one who changes everything. So He's the one that we praise. Uh, it's not about us. Uh, our salvation, our cleansing is not about us. You know, it's again ironic because what you see in too many, in too many sermons, in too many things is that this whole thing is done so that you can be a, a, a happy person and do this and do that and have a great job and have a great marriage. And it all seems about us, but it's not about us. It's about God. It's about glorifying God. Um, this week, we're remembering this great event this great time when uh, Jesus came into Jerusalem. And it was a joyous time. But unfortunately, it was joyous because they were expecting something completely different. And they were not ready for who Jesus is and what he really comes to do. Unfortunately, that hasn't changed. Unfortunately, it's still a reality today. People are still welcoming Jesus, but for all the wrong reasons. They're welcoming him because they want their checkbook taken care of. And they want this coronavirus not to affect them. And they want to have uh, healthy children. And they want to have a, a wonderful spouse and a great home. And that's why they welcome him in. And when any of this stuff falls apart, when things begin to fall apart, then, oh, no, 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 what, what's going on here? I, Jesus, get out. You know, I, I needed you here so you can take care of all these things. You were my accountant. You were, my, you were the one supposed to take care of all these things. You're not taking care of them. Get out of the house. I don't need you here. They're, they've invited him in, but for the wrong reasons. And once he cannot fulfill uh, the things that they want, they are going to get rid of him. But we welcome him in because we know who he truly is. We know what he has come to really, truly do. And we know when we are in his presence that we are sinners, that we are not worthy to stand before him. And so we come before him and we repent and we say, Lord, forgive me. Cleanse me. I'm a sinner. Uh, I repent of my sins. I repent of all that I've done against you. And no matter what occurs to me, I need you in my life. I need you to come in and to change my life and to be Lord of my life. And that's how he wants to come in. He wants to come into our lives. He wants to come into our church. He wants to come into our homes. He wants to come into our country, into our government. He wants to come everywhere, but not on our terms, on his terms, only his terms. And if he cannot come in on his terms, then all that awaits us is the judgment of being unclean and being a rebellious people against God. Today is a good day. It's a wonderful day. We'll remember Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And if, in a few days, he will be betrayed. He will suffer agony and he will die. But we also remember that also in a few days after that, he will rise from the grave. And this is a wondrous time, despite what we're going through, despite all the things that we're going through, to remember that Christ is risen that he is Lord, but he's Lord under his terms, not our terms. God bless you. I hope you have a wonderful Palm Sunday. I hope the Lord continues to bless you. Again, continue to be steadfast, continue to remain in prayer and in the word, and continue to encourage one another. God bless you. Until next time, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.